um, you can go forward with getting a green card, filing an I-130, and all the other forms. Okay, let's keep going here. Where to file? All petitioners filing standalone form I-130 must submit their petitions to the Chicago lockbox instead of a USCIS service center. Form I-130 petitions filed with the Chicago lockbox will be routed to and adjudicated at the appropriate USCIS service center. We're not going to be filing a standalone I-130 petition. We're, our I-130 is not going to be standalone. It's going to be standing with its buddies. It's I-485, the I-765, work authorization card. We're stacking this I-130 with a bunch of other forms. So this is not the standalone. Now, again, if I have, um, if I'm a permanent resident and I've married someone who's here legally, um, I'm going to be filing an I-130 standalone because I don't have a visa immediately available to me and I'm not able to adjust status and get the work authorization going right now. I have to wait a very, very, very long time. So this is important to know. Most people don't really understand this and it's not, it's hard to get from the website. It's very hard to get from the website. So. Um, Let's look down here at this note. This is important. Applicants who reside in the jurisdiction of the Baltimore, Maryland, USCIS District Office need to file their concurrent form I-130, I-485 package. What's that? That's what I'm talking about. Concurrent I-130 and I-485 packet with the Chicago lockbox according to the filing instructions on form I-485 for family-based adjustment of status applications. Again, this is all procedural stuff. We have a video tutorial that covers, it is well over an hour long, and it covers all the details of the procedural aspects of putting one of these applications together. But I don't want to go down that road right now. We're going to focus on what information goes in the forms, how to get this thing filled out right, because there's a lot of information just on that. So now let's hit the download instructions for Form I-130. And we're going to see what the, what the Immigration Service has to say about this stuff. Okay. Instructions for I-130, Petition for Alien Relative. Please read these instructions carefully to properly complete this form. If you need more space to complete an answer, use a separate sheet of paper. Write your name and alien registration number if any, at the top of each sheet of paper and indicate the part and number of the item which the, to which the answer refers. This is a very important thing to do because there might be additional information that you have to add to the form because it only gives you a couple little boxes. And so if you need to do that, then they're saying you have to put the question number, your name, if you have an A number, we'll get there, uh, at the top of the sheet of the paper and then that way the paper can be incorporated into the whole application. The filing addresses provided on this form reflect the most current information. Okay, that is procedural stuff. We're just going to blow that off. Don't worry about that. The part I say, improperly filed forms will be rejected and the fee returned with instructions to resubmit the entire filing using the current form instructions. Okay, so that's why we're going through this because you've got to re you can rely on these form instructions. What is the purpose of this form? We pretty much covered that. Who may file form I-130? Here we go. If you are a U.S. citizen, you must file a separate form I-130 for each eligible relative. You may file a form I-134. A, your husband or wife. Okay, here, this is the one we're talking about. 1A, a U.S. citizen filing for their husband or wife. If you are, have that in your life, you've come to the right place. This is for you. You're going to get a lot of value out of here. Your unmarried child under age 21, citizen, yeah, that's right. Unmarried son or daughter. Also, we also have um, other video tutorials that cover children's issues because there's a lot of different ways that children end up coming into the United States 
when the parent is mu married to a U.S. citizen. So uh, there's a lot of complexity around that. We've devoted a whole video tutorial on those issues. Your unmarried son or daughter, age 21 or older, yeah. Your married son or daughter of any age. Your brother or sister, you must be age 21 or older. Your mother or father, you must be age 21 or older, okay. These are all the categories of relationships that are covered under this form. If you are a lawful permanent resident in the United States, you may file this form for your husband or wife, your unmarried child under age 21, your unmarried son or daughter age 21 or older. So permanent residents can also use this, but there's a very long wait. Note, there is no visa category for married children of permanent residents. If an unmarried son or daughter of a permanent resident marries before the permanent resident becomes a U.S. citizen, any petition filed for that son or daughter will be automatically revoked. Now, that is heavy duty. Uh, so that's uh, important to know. I'm glad they put that there. Here's another one. If your relative qualifies under paragraph 1C, 1D, or 1E above, what are those? 1C... D or E, mm-hmm, okay. Separate petitions are not required for his or her husband or wife or unmarried children under 21 years of age. That's a good point. Um, now, even though separate petitions are not required um, for the unmarried children under 21 years of age, a 1C, your unmarried son or daughter, age 21 or older, married son or daughter. Uh, what happens when they turn 21 years of age? Well, there are different rules. They're very complex around uh, protecting the status of children when they age out into uh, adulthood. And um, so th there's a lot of complexity there. Again, that's the children's video that we have that covers that stuff more in depth. If your relative qualifies under 2B or 2C above, separate petitions are not required for his or her unmarried children under 21 years of age. Same kind of deal. The persons described in number 2 and 3 of the above note will be able to apply for an immigrant visa along with your relative. That's great. And you'll see on the form, on the there's a part of the form you list all your children of the of the beneficiary. You have a petitioner, the U.S. citizen who's filing or the permanent resident, and then the beneficiary is the person who's receiving the green card, wants to come in, who's from a, a different country. So um, the beneficiary, all the children, the beneficiary are listed there, and so they can be incorporated into getting a green card uh, when the time comes up for them who may not file this form I-130. You may not file for a person in the following categories. An adoptive parent or adoptive child if the adoption took place after the child's 16th birthday or if the child has not been in the legal custody and living with the parents for at least two years. And that's true. And there are some nuances around adoptions where courts can actually set back the adoption date before the 16th birthday, a little trick we use sometimes. And so uh, if you might want to consult with an immigration attorney if you have that situation because there's still some stuff that can be done for humanitarian reasons to get those kids, uh, get those adoptions taken place so that you can actually get a green card on it. And that's really awesome. It's great when that happens. A natural parent, if the U.S. citizen's son or daughter gained permanent residence through adoption. So, I got adopted by a new family. I can't bring my old family, my old parent, in. The, the line's been cut. That's what that means. A step-parent or step-child, if the marriage that created the relationship took place after the child's 18th birthday. So, the child has to be a young child under 18. Let's go ahead and get this uh, looking a little bigger here. 